Hi there, here I am with a series of Canterbury Tales videos, which is the first one. Uh, Canterbury Tales is written by Geoffrey Chaucer. It's one of the works and then maybe the most noticeable work of the Middle Ages, uh, the late Middle Ages. Uh, Geoffrey Chaucer uh, had written about different walks of life in this, in this work. He introduces different jobs, for example, different professions, different walks of people and all that. Uh, so I start with the general prologue, and then we would move on to some of the stories. Uh, and then I, I will explain the significance of some of the places, some of the people who are named with some of the professions. So let's see what is happening. Why are we reading uh, the story? The general prologue so introduces the main uh, pilgrims who are involved. Uh, then there are some pictures some, um, in the manuscripts or in different versions uh, of the Canterbury Tales later on published. Uh, and printed. Uh, that, uh, that, that there were many, many versions, for example, many manuscript form, and they were accompanied with some paintings, some colorings, and all that. Uh, the, the, the paintings might not be that much clearer because they were old in a way. The pictures made of the old versions of the Canterbury, as you can see. Uh, if you notice, we cannot read this text uh, because uh, actually, Middle English is not readable to us. We cannot read Middle English or we cannot speak in Middle English. Uh, the, the way of pronouncing words was different in the way of spelling of them. So there are modernized versions of the Cast and Canterbury Tales, and we're going to follow one of these modernized versions. And it, it actually, they are translated from the medieval English into modern English, which we speak today. And here, here's the story. The story begins in spring, so it's a it's a good time maybe to start uh, these videos, especially that the, the, the season is matching. When in April the sweet showers fall in pierce and drought of marsh to the root, and all veins are based in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. It, it's all about uh, the showers in spring and uh, the blooming of the flowers. When also Zephyrus with a sweet breath exhales in air and ever grove and haste upon the tender shoots. Zephyrus is, uh, is a wind, it's, it's a wind which is the messenger of spring. Uh, and it, 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 when it comes, it, it's kind of a clarion, a clarion call to the flowers, so the flowers are resurrecting when when they hear the sound of the wind and also Zephyrus where the sweet breath exhales in air every grove and heath grove is a forest and heath if you know what a heath is upon the tender shoots and the young sun the tender shoots of the flowers of course and the young sun has half course and the sign of the ram has run as spring and then the half and the half course sun sun is in half course on the sky uh, it means that we are in the middle of, uh, in, in, in the, at the beginning of April or the middle of Ram's course. Ram is the, the same as the same as uh, the same as the zodiac sign of Aries, and the small fowl are making melody. Fowl is a is a is beard actually, and the small fowl are making melody that sleep away the night with open eye. So nature pricks them in their heart engages. Then people long to go on pilgrimages. So when 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 we are at this season, the people long to go on pilgrimages. Pilgrimages uh, or making and taking a pilgrim pilgrimage uh, was something uh, quite familiar to the medieval culture. Uh, the people went to a saint or to a, to a place which was considered holy generally, and they asked for different things. They they prayed there. So it is uh, that because it's spring, the, the weather is getting warmer. It's a good kind of a uh, time season to go on pilgrimages in England. The people long to go on pilgrimages, and palmers long to seek their stranger strands. Strands means uh, beaches, coasts of different countries, different lands. It was customary to go to abroad even uh, to a pilgrimage. For example, people went to Jerusalem, uh, the Holy Land, or the different places marked by the names of various saints or major Christian figures. Afar, afar, sorry, it stands afar of saints, hallowed in sundry lands. Uh, Sandra means various, and especially from every shire's end of England down to Canterbury, they went to seek the holy blessful martyr, 
quick to give us help to them when they were sick. Uh, the scene in Canterbury is called Thomasy Beckett or Thomas Beckett. Thomas Beckett was a friend of uh, King Henry II of England. Uh, they were childhood friends and all the time they were together. They were best friends. Uh, but when Henry becomes uh, the king, uh, and he wants to give some position to his uh, friend who is now a clergyman. Uh they, 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 there, there are some squeamishes between the two. And even for a while, for five years, uh, Thomas Beckett leaves England, and he, he lives in France, actually. But the friendship is renewed, and uh, Thomas Beckett is back to England. He's now the Archbishop of Canterbury. But again, there are problems between the two. Henry prefers power, while... Uh, why Thomas Beckett prefers uh, religious kind of powers. So one, one of them is a politician. He, he urges for political power an ultimate kind of an absolute political power. And on the other side, uh, Beckett thinks, thinks religion and belief is more important. So once again, there are quarrels between the two. And it ends it that the one night, Henry, while he's at the table, he... He says that he wants to get rid of Thomas Beckett. He says, who is going to say to set me free from him? And the bad luck we can say, unfortunately, four of his knights overhear him and they go to Canterbury and kill Thomas Beckett while, while he's praying there. So he, he was not even aware that people are attacking him and he, he died in that way. Sad, uh, they say Canterbury is a martyr, and the people of England believe that if they visit his his deathbed uh, each each spring, uh, he he would help them to uh, to 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 find some some treatment for the sick, or the sick uh, would would be free of their pains. So this is the story of Thomas Beckett and why he's considered a holy person. He's canonized actually many years later, some centuries later. The people, as a saint, the people considered his his the, the place of his death, the place of his martyrdom as a holy land. It happened that it happened in that season that one day in Southwark at the Tabard, Tabard is the name of an inn in the city and a town, as I lay ready to go on pilgrimage and start for Canterbury. Most devout at heart, at night there came into the hostelry some nine and twenty in a company of sundry folk, happening then to fall in fellowship, and they were pilgrims all, that towards Canterbury meant to ride. Twenty-nine pilgrims had found one another uh, while they are on their way, and they they meet this the, this narrator, most probably Geoffrey Chaucer of the story, so they, they met in this tabard inn, and let's see what is happening next. The rooms and stables of M were wide. They made us easy, always at the best. And briefly, when the sun had gone to rest, and it means it was sunset, I'd spoken to them all upon the trip and was soon one with them in fellowship, pledged to rise early and to take the way to Canterbury, as you heard me say. So they decided to continue the pilgrimage together. But nonetheless... While I have time and space before my story takes a further pace, it seems reasonable to say what their condition was, the full array of each of them, as it appeared to me, according to a professional degree, and what apparel they were riding in, and at a night I therefore will begin. So before before starting his journey and the, and, and, and the rest of the narrative, he prefers to introduce each one of the pilgrims and he starts with the person who is of the highest rank among the pilgrims who is the knight. Uh, the, the, there was a feudal system in the medieval times at the, at the top of that um, pyramid of, of the population where the court in the royal family and then there were the, the landowners and after the landowners were the knights who had the responsibility to keep um, to keep the the lands of the landowners safe, and then um, and right in the bottom there were the peasants who were living and working on those lands. So um, knights 
though they they were just in the third kind of rank, uh, they were considered uh, differently by the society. We can say they they were special guests everywhere they went because of their their maybe uh, their success, their kind of skill. Uh, they they could they could fight and manners. So they they were very interesting kind of. Uh, rank of the society and this is shown in Canterbury Tales by giving uh, the first position to the knight when Chaucer wants to introduce each one of them uh, he is the most distinguished man among the pilgrims there was a knight a most distinguished man who from the day on which he first began to ride abroad had followed chivalry so there were some chivalric ideals each knight had to follow some ideals, some maxims, and this knight uh, shows that he is the best in them. And these are his, the ideals of a true knight, truth, honor, generousness, and courtesy. You have to be generous to your upland. You have to show courtesy, especially to women. They, they, there are manners in treating and, and behaving women at the time. And they, they, they had an honor. They, they were... Uh, they were responsible figure figures and they, they they were always true to their ideals and values he had done nobly in his sovereign's war he he actually fights for someone else and ridden into battle no more as well in christian as in heathen places and ever honored for his noble graces uh this knight has seen many countries and because he took part in crusades most probably that's why they said that he he fought in Christian heathen places. Christian refers to different Christian European countries, and heathen uh, most probably refers to Islamic lands, uh, especially the Ottoman Empire and the borderline of this empire. The Ottoman Empire mostly um, is was placed in modern day Turkey, or the the, the places around the Mediterranean Sea. When he took Alexandria, Alexandria is in Africa, uh, so in Egypt. When he took Alexandria, he was there. He often sat at table in the chair of honor above all nations when in Prussia. Prussia is modern-day Germany, is a reference to that. In Lithuania, he had written in Russia. No Christian man so often of his rank. When in Granada in Spain, Algeciras, Algeria, sank under assault, he had been there and in North Africa, riding Benamarin. In Anatolia, different places in Turkey, in Anatolia, he had been as well. And fought when Ayas and Atalia fell, different names of uh, the uh, ancient names of Turkish places. For all along the Mediterranean coast, he had embarked with many a noble host. So he fought in many battles. In 15 mortal battles he had been, and just that for our faith at uh, Tramesin, uh, the, the, it's it, for our faith Christianity, and he was at a crusade battle with Muslims in the borders of the Ottoman Empire. And this is an act of jousting, as you can see, the, of a battle between two knights. Thrice and the lists and always killed his man. This this same distinguished knight had led the van once with the Bay of Balas, again a place in Turkey, doing work for him against another heathen Turk. Hidden, uh, it is customary that at, at the medieval times they called Muslims heathens because Christianity was considered as a true religion and Islam was considered as a fake, fasted religion. So. Uh, this is a medieval belief, especially that the Christians and the um, and the Muslims were in battles all the time. And it is it is anyway interestingly uh, there that uh, among the Muslims also uh, the Christians were called uh, heathens or the people without faith, faces and the people uh, who don't believe in a true religion. So both parties believe that the other party is fake. He was of sovereign value in all eyes. Anyway, back to the night. And though so much distinguished, he was wise and his bearing modest as a maid. He's uh, such a modest guy. He never yet a 
Boorish Singh had said, in all his life to any, come one might, who was a true perfect gentle knight. And about his appearance, speaking of his equipment, he possessed fine horses, but he was not gaily dressed. Gaily means in a colorful, kind of modern fashion, fashionable way. Uh, he wore a fustian, uh, a kind of a clothes, the fustian is a kind of a clothes, a fustian tunic stained in dark, but smudges where his armor had left mark. Just home from service, he had joined our ranks, so he had no time maybe to change, uh, to do his pilgrimage and render thanks. So here the introduction of the night ends and therefore this video ends here. Uh, I will introduce the rest of the programs uh, in, in the next videos. So thank you for listening.